being rude and texting anyone. My notes are on here. So, um, I'd like to say thank you to the museum board and to Mark Linehan for uh, seeing fit to honor dad this way. And I'd like to thank Darby for making the trip with his beautiful daughter, India. Uh, made it really special. Um, I'm honored to accept this award on behalf of my dad, although I wish he were here to do it himself. Um, a lot of you might know that Fess was uh, born in Fort Worth and raised in San Angelo, Texas, and then he's a graduate of the class of 1950 at UT. Um, and I know that the best of Texas is probably not viewed as that great by all of you from Oklahoma, but I just I thought I would mention that. Um, he did go to Hollywood and he had some really good luck and, uh, and went on to have a great career in real estate and, and with the winery, but uh, he, he definitely stayed true to his, uh, his Texas roots. He even, uh, and we still do, fly the Texas flag outside the little inn up in Los Olivos. He used to refer to it as the Texas Embassy. So you'll have to come out and visit. Um, some of my best memories with Dad are when we go up to a ranch that he had in the Santa Maria Valley. And he taught us to ride, and uh, he tried to teach me to rope. I was hopeless, but I can shoot a gun, and uh, I can work cattle. And those were some of the best times we ever had. And um, he tried to wear boots and jeans every chance he could. I'd say 99% of the days he was on this earth, he was wearing jeans and, and, uh, and boots. And I think that uh, I think it's important that all of you know that he was as good a man uh, in real life as he was on screen. He was a great father and a great husband and a really good guy. And, uh, and unless you think, I don't want you to think that being in the wine business sissified him at all because literally right up until the last few weeks of his life, he really enjoyed just a little cold beer with his, <laughs> with his lunch. Um, more than anything, he knew he was incredibly lucky to have been cast in the role of Davy Crockett and then again uh, in Daniel Boone. He knew he was lucky in this life and he appreciated it. And I know that he would, um, he would appreciate this award very much. So thank you. Our next presenter is a highly regarded Western artist, TV, and movie actor, with credits from Gunsmoke to Tombstone. He is the son of the great character actor Dub Taylor, and both are inductees into the Hall of Great Western Performers. So it is fitting that he is presenting our next inductee, sponsored by Cummings Oil Company. Tell you what, Buck, we'll try and keep you on stage longer than you are alive in Cowboys and Aliens. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Buck Taylor. <laughs> Thank you very much. Wyatt, appreciate the introduction. And as of now, I've been on this stage longer than I was in the movie Cowboys and Aliens. I look out here every time I come here, and I'm, I'm so grateful to be in the presence of people that, that share my love for our, our great American West. And, uh, Tonight, I'm so privileged to be able to be part of the induction of, of a good friend of mine, Bruce Boxleitner, into the Hall of Great Western Performers. <laughs> Bruce, this is a special night. It's, uh, you're with your family, your mom and dad, and your son, Michael, and Lee, and Sam and Dakota, and they wish they were here with you, but they couldn't make it, but your son Michael is, and uh, it's, a, it's a special evening, and this evening for you is being sponsored by the Cummings Oil Company. Speaking of oil <laughs> and gas and diesel, 
Hey, I got a good idea. Why don't we all just drill some oil here in America so we don't have to rely on those people in the Mideast? <laughs> You see, Bruce agrees with me on that. We came from the school of John Wayne, Brendan, Anita, and James Arness. And I got to tell you a story about Bruce and I and James Arness. We were so privileged to have worked with a television icon, uh, me and Gunsmoke, and Bruce later in How the West Was Won. And uh, what a great honor we had, Bruce. Uh, Jim was so proud and so honored to have Bruce co-star with him in the great television series, How the West Was Won. Uh, I don't think Bruce has gotten over it yet, actually. <laughs> but Bruce is, he's done more television series than any actor I know. He went from the Western, which got him started, to uh, Scarecrow and Mrs. King, to uh, Kenny Rogers in the West. Then he went out in High Five, a sci-fi of science fiction, and outer space, and then he came back to the Western. And that's, that's why he's here tonight. It's the Western part of Bruce that we know, the American cowboy. And we're going to see some film on it right now, Bruce. Bruce Boxleitner was bitten by the horse bug early in life. He always loved horses and wanted to live in cowboy country, even though he grew up in the corn and dairy country of northeastern Illinois. We raised hay, corn, lots of corn, fields and fields of corn. I was a cowboy, all right. I went with a stick and a dog and went and brought the cows home at night for milking. I'd walk them in. I didn't have a horse to do it on, but... I was a cowboy. I mean, I went and got the cows. That was a great thing. Bruce had many happy days with his grandparents on their family farm. And not all of it working. The adventures I had out there all by myself, whatever character I was playing, I think I was an actor even back then. When I saw a movie or I saw like Davy Crockett, I played Davy Crockett. I made an old stick into my old Betsy musket and off we went. Eventually, Bruce had horses of his own and enjoyed sharing rides with everyone in the family. But his way west came via the stage. Now all that make-believe that I had done out in, in front of farm animals, <laughs> my first audience, they were captive. Um, I now had, um, somehow I got on the stage and uh, in high school and I just felt this is what I want to do. How I was going to go about it, I had no idea. Fortunately, Bruce's drama teacher had a plan. She used her influence to get him an entree into the prestigious Goodman Theater School at the Art Institute of Chicago. In 1973, he landed the lead in a play called Status Quo Vatus. I did this play in Chicago, my first big break in theater, and it ended up taking me to Broadway. And there was another unknown guy in that cast, a guy named Ted Danson. I have no idea what ever happened to that fella. That play landed Bruce an agent. But the big screen roles he had his eye on were out in California, where all his life he had dreamed of living. I came out to the West Coast on a one-way ticket. I figured it'd be pretty warm there if I had to sleep on park benches or something like that. I never had to. I was very, very fortunate. And I came out and I had an agent and I started to get little parts. And the first part that I got was five lines on the Mary Tyler Moore Show. I don't know if these are the perfect circumstances, but would you like to go to a movie tonight? That got me my SAG card, my after card. All my paycheck went to get me in that. And um, for long, I was doing Beretta. I was doing all those shows at the time. Little, I was playing punks and all kinds of fun parts. That's when Bruce got the role he says changed his career and his life. James Arness chose him from a group of 20 actors for a role in what would become the miniseries How the West Was Won. I was standing there in the middle of Utah in these red rock canyons with James Arness and I'm on a horse and he's this big mountain of a man. And you know, every once in a while having to pinch myself going, I cannot believe I'm actually doing it. This is my boyhood dream come true. After that, Bruce played a variety of Western sidekicks and characters, including Billy Montana in the Kenny Rogers Gambler movies, before being asked to read for a completely different type of role. 
I was actually doing a Western playing young Wyatt Earp when I got this script. Uh, and uh, I'm sitting out on my horse and I, I got the script in the saddlebag and I'm trying to make heads or tails of this thing going Tron. He played the part of the title character, a video game warrior, in that groundbreaking sci-fi spectacular that would see a reprise in 2010 with another sequel now in the works. While that role in the part of space station captain John Sheridan in the 90s space opera Babylon 5 might seem a stretch for a guy who'd played mostly cowboy sidekicks, Bruce sees a lot of similarities in characters. I like the world of imagination. I played that when I was a little boy. I was always off uh, being Flash Gordon or somebody like that. Uh, a good story is a good story. It can be on Mars or it can be in the deserts of Arizona. In fact, he has blended science fiction with classic tales of the West in the two frontier Earth novels he's authored. But the role that has won him the most loyal fan base is that of American agent Lee Stetson, opposite Kate Jackson in Scarecrow and Mrs. King. Their kids are watching those shows, you know, that weren't even alive then, uh, and they were kids. But so uh, it's a marvelous, um, I've just been very, very blessed and I'm so thankful. I was literally the epitome of what Horace Greeley said, go west young man to seek your fame and fortune. And I did. And I, I'm very happy to say I did. I, I did get it, <laughs> you know, I got to live it. Bruce Boxleitner, the newest member of the Hall of Great Western Performers, still lives and loves the Western lifestyle and is saddled and ready for any cowboy roles that lope his way. Have hat, will travel, you know. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in congratulating our newest inductee, in the Hall of Great Western Performers, Mr. Bruce Boxleitner. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, wow. It's a very um, humbling experience. Uh, I first stood on this stage in 1976 receiving a Wrangler Award for the pilot of How the West Was Won. It was called the McCanns. Stood here with uh, Eva Marie Saint and the producer John Mantley. This long-haired, mustached man standing next to me was named Sam Elliott. I think you know him around here. And Wyatt, um, your, uh, your grandfather was making his way up the aisle, and uh, Sam, with that big old mustache, stood next to me and he says, Bruce, this here's what it's all about. And I'm, we're standing there like two goofy school kids, because here comes Joel McRae, about to win the Wrangler Award for a film called Mustang Country. And uh, I looked at Sam when he said that, and you know, that mustache never moved. You didn't know where that voice came from. Um, first of all, I want to I thank everybody at the Western Heritage Museum for having me back this time around. And I also want to say that um, tonight I'm especially honored to be being inducted into the Hall of Fame with Fess Parker because I am of the baby boom generation and I was one of those little boys with a coonskin uh, skin cap on my head. Like my mother has a photo somewhere. I have no teeth in the front, but I got that coonskin cap and I'm wearing it very proudly and smiling. He was my first big hero, Davy Crockett. So, that is a, it is a great honor to be going in there with him. But I want to dedicate this tonight to a man that uh, Buck mentioned earlier. I would not be standing here if it was not for James Arness. Um, I only recently learned, thank you, 
Um, the day he died this last year, I was called up by a radio station very early in the morning. And um, they said, had you heard the news? Well, that's, that's a heck of a thing to be on live radio. And I said, no, I hadn't. And I was in a great deal of shock. I didn't, I didn't know uh, Jim. He was a very reclusive man, very secretive, not secretive, but very private person. And um, the only thing I could think of, and the first thing out of my mouth was, I said, well, the world has, has lost Matt Dillon, but I lost my Uncle Zed. And uh, if it wasn't for him, um, my beautiful son down here would not be here probably. My other boys, he changed my life with that one decision that he said, no, I, I want that third fella. I want that third fella. He was sitting in a screening room with Mike Eisner. They were trying to pitch this other actor for the role of young Luke McCann. And Jim saw something in me in my screen test that, that, he, that he liked, that he wanted in his show. And he had the final approval. And he stuck to his guns and Mike Eisner lost and stomped out of the room. And I got the role of, of Luke McCann. And um, that gave me my career. It was my first big break. And so I'll always be eternally grateful to him as I am grateful to all of you for having me here once again and receiving this beautiful Wrangler Award. Thank you so much. That gentleman right there is the real deal, let me tell you. He, he lives what we all preach about, and he's a good guy. Our next presenter was a farrier, a professional hunting and fishing guide, and a PRCA steer wrestler before he ended up in Hollywood, where he has starred in major motion pictures, like always, in Flight of the Intruder. He's a two-time Wrangler Award winner for his roles in Crossfire Trail and Ned Blessing. He is also a writer, a producer, a true renaissance man. Please welcome Mr. Brad Johnson. I still haven't got past the visual of the uh, naked cowboy crossing the barbed wire fence yet, sorry. <laughs> and uh, congratulations, Bruce. Shakespeare and Aristotle teach us the transfer of thought to paper is a talent few possess. These men have a way with words where others no have way. Uh, sorry folks, you hire a, you know, an old steer wrestler slash hunting guy, this is what you get. This next Wrangler Award for Outstanding Magazine article sponsored by Mr. and Mrs. Mike Nicola goes to When Wind Coop Was Sheriff, written by Lewis Kraft and published in Wild West Magazine. This article tells a future Army officer who dished out his own brand of justice as a territorial lawman in what would become Colorado. This is a story of an extraordinary man who is both flawed and admirable. According to news reports at the time, Wynn Coop was a bad man who carried a revolver in his belt and was generally in debt. While most statements were true, Wynn Coop was also a critic of the Sand Creek Massacre of Cheyenne and Arapaho tribal members in 1864. He was removed from cavalry command for his efforts to resolve the conflict prior to the attack. The Sand Creek tragedy changed Wynn Coop from a racially prejudiced person to someone who accepted all people. He devoted the rest of his career as a soldier and then as a U.S. Indian agent to helping the Cheyenne and Arapaho survive. Here to accept the award for outstanding magazine article is author Lewis Kraft and associate editor Stephen Morrow.
You can bet I'm going to hold this cowboy. <laughs> uh, National Cowboy and Western, Western Heritage Museum. Thank you for inviting Steve and myself to your shindig. We're having a great time. Some of my best friends are my editors. And one of my good, good, good friends has been my editor since the late 1980s. His name is Greg Lelier at Wild West. Wild West is just one of a whole slew of great history magazines that Weeder History Group publishes. Greg and I have had a great give and take, give and take relationship as we've tried to get all our facts straight and yet at the same time create page turners. There's one thing I want to say about Greg. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be standing here tonight. Uh, <laughs> uh, I hope by now that a few of you know who, or at least have heard of this fellow Ned Winku. He was just like you and me. He had a family he loved with all his heart. He had successes and he had failures. And just like some of us, he struggled to survive. But there's one thing about Ned Wincoop, one thing that he had more than most of us, certainly more than me, guts. Guts to take a look at his world, a world full of war and hate and Cheyennes and Arapahoes. He was able to take a look at his 1860s world and challenge it. He dared to reach out to people that were different from him and accept them as human beings. Thank you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> never thought I'd kiss a cowboy. National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum, speaking for Wild West, my editor Greg Lelier, Steve, and the rest of the staff there, we're honored. Thank you. The winner of our next literary category is a book that documents one man's four-decade quest to produce one of the finest surveys of the 20th century Native American and Southwestern art, sponsored by the Belger Cartage Services. The Wrangler Award winner in the Outstanding Art Book category is the Eugene B. Adkins Collection, Selected Works. Byron Price and a host of contributors celebrate Mr. Adkins' extraordinary collection of art through a rich photographic sampling of works and informative essays. The collection of Tulsa native Eugene Adkins, now shared by the Fred Jones Junior Museum at the University of Oklahoma and the Philbrook Museum of Tulsa, includes paintings, photographs, jewelry, baskets, textiles, and ceramics by many of the Southwest's most renowned artists. Whether you view the book published by the University of Oklahoma Press for its beauty or for its scholarly research, the Eugene B. Adkins Collection provides a unique view of a vital component of our nation's cultural heritage. Accepting the award for Outstanding Art Book are Gilon Demure, Director of the Fred Jones Junior Museum of Art, Contributing Author and Curator of Native American and Non-Western Art at the Philbrook, Christina Burke, and contributing author and publisher at the University of Oklahoma Press, Byron Price. All right. Well, I don't have the um, cowboy accent, so I will try my best, but so I'm sorry for that. <laughs> I do practice, believe me. Um, 
The books is beautiful, and of course, I want to thank Byron Price and the uh, University of Oklahoma Press. Uh, but more important, and also Mr. Atkins, to give us this possibility to uh, show his collection, uh, build to museum, and uh, do education. But more important for us, it was an amazing collaboration between two museums, the Phil Brook in Tulsa and the Fred John Junior Museum of Art at University of Oklahoma. Uh, for us, it was under the leadership of President Boren, of course, who is uh, so dedicated to education. But he was a visionary about how could we make this collection staying in Oklahoma? How could we use this collection to teach to all of this generation of students from Oklahoma and Texas, by the way. We have many students from Texas. And all of that was done with a collaboration based on a book. And this um, um, beautiful uh, publication is really a great example of what museums should be doing around the, uh, the country, working together, sharing their uh, collection, uh, exchanging, showing more anything we could to uh, all the visitors. And again, publication is the most important thing for us because it's our academic way of showing how we are uh, dedicated to education. So I want to thank you very much for this award. Christina Burke from the uh, uh, Philbrook is going to have a word uh, on behalf of Tulsa. Thank you again. Thank you all very much. Um, on, I really am honored to be here this evening. It's a privilege and a pleasure. On behalf of Philbrook's director, Rand Suffolk, the, the board, all of the staff, I want to thank you very much for this recognition. I'd also like to thank my colleagues at the Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art at the University of Oklahoma and everyone at OU Press who worked so hard to create this beautiful book. And for us, it's also about future collaborations as Philbrook moves forward with its plans for a satellite facility in Tulsa's thriving downtown Arts District, which will be the future home of the Adkins Collection and Study Center. Now, it may surprise you that um, I'm not from Oklahoma. You can probably tell by my accent. Um, I'm actually from back east. Um, and my perspective on the American West has very much been influenced by the native people with whom I work, and particularly the Lakota people of the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, with whom I worked for many years. Um, and in the words of my Lakota friends, I'd like to say to you, Le hon hepi washteki, li la trante ma washtena, iuha, wopi la tranka, pilamayaye, which roughly translates as On this beautiful evening, my heart is filled with joy, and I want to thank each and every one of you. Thank you very much. I don't believe I can top that, but uh, on behalf of the uh, University of Oklahoma Press, which is perhaps the only press uh, uh, in the country that actually has a person on staff that is known as the image wrangler, uh, a particularly important person for an art book like this. Thank you to our partners. Thank you to our many staff members, who some of whom have joined us here uh, this evening. Thank you to the Cowboy Museum, uh, its board of directors, uh, and the judges in this category. Thank you very much. It is now my pleasure to introduce two friends of this museum who are also friends of the Western movie. Rex Lynn is one of the stars of this popular TV series, series CSI Miami. And he's currently filming one of the most anticipated films of 2013, Quentin Tarantino's Django Unchanged. It's going to be a blockbuster. Talk about keeping the Western alive. Maybe we're rolling, baby. <laughs> His buddy Robert Knott is an actor, writer, producer, with movies like the Wrangler Award-winning Appaloosa to his credit. Please welcome Rex and Robert. And may God have mercy on our soul for letting them present together. Happy to be here. Uh, Wyatt just wanted me to be sure and tell you all if you ain't done it yet to be sure and turn off your beepers and your pagers. Wow. 
Anyway. How you doing, brother? Good to be up here with my buddy Rex Lynn. Glad you, you're uh, making a Western, which is a good thing. Well, that dingo unchained, that's Western, right? Working with Quentin Tarantino has been fantastic. I was just thinking today, the last time we saddled up uh, was your movie, Appaloosa, in 2007. Yeah, and unfortunately, you didn't get to saddle up. You didn't get to ride a horse in that movie. Well, whose fault was that? You wrote the damn thing. Well, I know that, but you, you got to ride on a train. How was that? Train's not a horse, Robert. Well, I understand that, but you get to ride in this uh, Quentin Tarantino, uh, what is the name of it? Django Unchained. Yeah, you get to ride a horse in that, so there I you do. Go. As a matter of fact, let me interrupt. Go uh, ahead. Uh, I, he I get, always does. I get to not only ride a horse, but I ride a famous horse named Apollo. Jeff Bridges rode Apollo in True Grit, so they put me on one of the top horses. Yeah, well, speaking of Jeff Bridges, uh, he shot me dead in the street in uh, Wild Bill, directed by Walter Hill. Okay, I got shot by Kevin Costner in Wide Earth, in the OK Corral, in one of the most famous gun fights in Western history. Yeah, well, you've been shot by a lot of people, haven't you? I have. Yeah, you've yep. been shot by Tom Selleck a couple of times too, right? I have. What were those movies? Last Stand at Sabre River and Crossfire Trail, but no, let me tell you something. Nothing was as brutal as what Danny Glover did to you in Buffalo Soldier. Oh, all right, I know. Hung his little honey up in the tree. No, that's okay. Uh, you remember I, that? I, I remember that, yeah. I remember that. And, and honestly, it was at that time when my mother said to me, and she actually said this to Rex too, she said, well, look at it. Look at it this way, guys. I mean, look at the bright side of things. At least you're getting killed by movie stars now. We're going to miss you, Mama Not. <laughs> anyway, our first Wrangler Award present tonight is for the Outstanding Documentary, sponsored by Jimmy Rain. The winner is Main Street, Wyoming. Charles Belden, cowboy photographer by Wyoming PBS. And although he was a 1909 graduate of MIT, Charles Belden ultimately settled down at the historic Pitchfork Ranch in Wyoming, where he began taking photos of everyday life on a quarter million acres. His classic images of Western America and American West were published nationally in major magazines, conveying a sense of energy, vitality, adventure, and hardship. You know a lot about hardship, don't you, Rex? I'm having some right now with you up here. Uh, <laughs> Main Street, Wyoming features many of Belden's most famous photographs, interviews with his granddaughter, historians, and a restoration of his dark room. The historical presentation, part of a Wyoming PBS series, is written and produced by Tom Manning, directed by Kyle Nikoloff, and produced by Ruby Calvert. Yeah, and the documentary is a, is a fascinating look at Charles Belden's life and times. Accepting the Wrangler Award for Outstanding Documentary, writer and producer Tom Manning and director Kyle Nikoloff. night. Um, I first encountered Charles Belden's photography while working on another documentary um, about an abandoned mining town in northwest Wyoming called Kerwin. Um, during my research for that I ran across this photograph of this handsome young woman sitting on a corral fence, kind of short cropped hair, and it turned out to be none other than Amelia Earhart, who loved that part of the country and was in fact building a cabin up there before she met her demise. Um, further research showed me that it was Charles Belden that took this photograph and there was something about it that made me want to know more, and as I investigated more, I came across this incredible, incredible body of work by this man that's today pretty much unknown, but back then 
he was the most famous photographer in America, or at least one of them. And at a press conference earlier today, I was talking about this, and um, Ernie turns to me and says, well, hell yeah, I remember Charles Belden, you know? <laughs> Um, so Charles Belden, or just plain Charlie, as most folks uh, called him, was on a mission to document the life of uh, Wyoming's cowboys at kind of a, on the cusp of change from the free grass open prairie to the uh, more mechanized ranching. And there's this spectacular photograph that really kind of summarizes this. It's a, it's a shot of this cowboy on a horse. Uh, and he's looking over his shoulder, and he's looking over his shoulder, and there's this plane coming in overhead. And it kind of really epitomizes kind of the shift from the old way of doing things to the, to the new way. Um, each day, he'd pack his saddlebags with his Zeiss Palmos camera and glass plates. He was still using glass plates, and he'd go out riding and on his horse, Pinky. And Pinky learned to stand stock still until he heard the shutter click. Um, just amazing, amazing photographs. So um, I'd like to thank my director and cameraman, Kyle, Kyle here, and uh, Tom Thompson Coles, who couldn't be here tonight as my editor. And I'd like to also thank uh, Wyoming PBS for the opportunity to tell this story. And of course, uh, a big thank you to uh, the National Cowboy Museum here for recognizing this production about this little-known American master, Charles Belden, cowboy photographer. Thank you. All right. So later tonight, uh, we will witness uh, Temple Grandin being inducted into the Hall of...